Good morning, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be back at HIVNAT, uh, Bangkok Symposium. And this time we've got, I think, a big team of Malaysians here to learn and um, from the conference. Continuing on this morning's theme of uh, populations, countries, and individuals being left behind, I've been asked to speak on people who use drugs and the health needs of uh, people who use drugs. And just um, in the artwork at the bottom of uh, my slide there, just to remind that drug use has been um, with us since mankind. And um, so it really is uh, nothing new, but it's in how we manage this problem that I think has created more harm uh, than good globally. So in terms of the health needs, um, I think it goes without saying that there's increased prevalence and frequency of both medical and psychiatric illnesses in people who use drugs. People who use drugs die a lot younger than um, those who don't. Um, and the number and range of comorbid disorders, not just uh, substance use disorders, related complications, but other uh, complications, in particular mental illness, um, is uh, very much more prevalent amongst people who use drugs. And needless to say, this complicates care uh, for, uh, uh, towards um, individuals who use drugs. So this is, uh, let's start with HIV and Hep C. Um, the uh, HIV epidemic uh, has been mentioned uh, this morning, and uh, as Fritz pointed out, nowhere um, in, the, in, in the world, except for perhaps uh, Central Asia and uh, former Soviet Union, where uh, the incidence of HIV is rising a lot faster than, than the rest of the world. And uh, in Asia, as you saw uh, from the data that Fritz presented amongst MSM, that is uh, contributing uh, significantly to the lack of control of the HIV epidemic globally. Indeed, with uh, people who use drugs, the situation is uh, similar, if not worse, and you can see the prevalence rates in the... Um, uh, oh, I can't show... Anyway, the... Um, the figures on, the, on my right are for HIV and the figures on, on the left are for hepatitis C and the numbers uh, in Asia are uh, essentially in the double digits in most of the countries in, in um, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, the uh, the uh, significant, the, the prevalence is much more significant with hepatitis C than uh, HIV. The background, the, the global map, is that of uh, harm reduction programs globally from the global state of harm reduction that the International Harm Reduction uh, Association publishes each year. The red denotes uh, presence of both needle syringe and uh, opiate substitution therapy. And the blue is where neither opiate substitution therapy nor uh, needle syringe programs are uh, present. And uh, of course, I think um, most people in the room would know that the Philippines um, are having huge uh, problems in terms of introducing evidence-based uh, HIV and Hep C prevention programs. So the picture is not pretty in terms of uh, access to prevention programs that where the evidence has been present for decades in terms of the effectiveness of both OST and NSP to prevent HIV and to a less extent hepatitis C in the region. What about the continuum of care? We focus uh, firstly on HIV. <clears throat> in terms of the uh, HIV continuum of care, the 1990-90, uh, globally, um, the numbers are not looking good. Um, in developed countries, uh, in France, um, uh, perhaps uh, they're doing uh, much, much better than, than others in, in comparison to the United States. Uh, France reports uh, an 80% um, uh, figure of, of those on ART. I have to point to the computer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Pan. Um, 
and uh, and okay, that works. Hmm, it's pointing here, but okay, never mind. Uh, in the United States, it's it's thirty four percent. And needless to say, the percentage of uh, people who use drugs who are virally suppressed uh, is just uh, simply woeful. Uh, ranging from 8% in Kyrgyzstan and all these countries are uh, countries with uh, reasonably um, uh, high uh, problems with injecting drug use. Here in Thailand, you, you, it's reported that only 20% of people who inject drugs are on ART and uh, the um, uh, level of undetectable uh, uh, viral load is only 9%. In Malaysia, we're not doing any better either. This is from a cohort that's, um, uh, that's being tested and followed through the Global Fund funded case management program from the Malaysian AIDS Council. Although we managed to reach uh, close to uh, 5,000 people who inject drugs within uh, the period of one year, only 50% underwent testing, HIV testing. Fortunately, um, the uh, prevalence has dropped uh, in Malaysia, but as you can see, only a quarter of those who were um, uh, tested positive are on treatment. What about prevention? What about PrEP? We've heard a lot about PrEP this morning. Um, the only PrEP study, uh, as you know, famously, was uh, conducted here in Thailand. Um, and since then, there has never been any other um, PrEP studies um, around the world. And there are actually very few uh, original uh, uh, studies on PrEP in injecting drug users. The uh, literature that has followed are mostly from uh, follow-ups of uh, the ir original bangkok tenofovir study. Uh, following the uh, announcement of the PrEP of the uh, Bangkok Tenofovir study, CDC has recommended that PrEP uh, be also uh, used in uh, people who use drugs. But I think we all know that um, in terms of implementation, whether it's in uh, advanced, uh, in, in, in developed countries or in um, low and middle income countries, uh, PrEP in people who use drugs certainly lag uh, behind uh, PrEP in MSM. The concern, of course, is the uh, adherence. Um, and uh, here's a, uh, some follow-up study in the bangkok Tenofovir study where um, adherence to daily PrEP amongst people who inject drugs was low overall, um, with uh, of those who were still on PrEP, 47% had less than 10% adherence, but 25% um, had very high adherence. And some of the factors that were associated with adherence uh, include male sex, imprisonment, and injecting midazolam. Moving on to hepatitis C. Um, again, the um, the American Liver Society and the IDSA, the Infectious Disease Society of America, uh, recommends, this is from a, an update in 2017, regardless of treatment setting, recent and active uh, injecting drug use, drug use should not be seen as an absolute contraindication to hep C therapy. There's strong evidence that uh, people who inject drugs have demonstrated adherence to treatment and low rates of infection depending on settings. And here's the 2018 guidelines, uh, which states that annual hep C testing is recommended for those with no prior testing. More frequent testing, the level of risk is high, that we should be offering opt-out testing at uh, substance use treatment centers and NSP programs with immediate RNA testing and linkage to care if positive, counseling, etc. And again, Active or recent drug use is not a contraindication to hep C treatment. Um, and at least annual testing for those who have uh, achieved uh, SVR or, or have spontaneously cleared uh, HCV infection. And certainly there's not lack of evidence of uh, the effectiveness of the DAAs in uh, people who inject drugs. This is a systematic uh, review and meta-analysis just recently published 
of um, the effectiveness of uh, the DAAs for uh, people who inject or use drugs for hepatitis C. And among individuals with recent drug use, um, the overall um, effectiveness is 87.7%, whereas amongst individuals who were receiving um, opiate substitution therapy, the um, conversion rate is much higher, is, is slightly higher, it's 90.7. So certainly there is uh, not lack of evidence that uh, treatment uh, of people who inject use or who inject drugs um, with the DAAs for hepatitis C uh, is effective. However, just like with the story of HIV, um, the, uh, in terms of being left behind, uh, there is no question that, um, that people who inject drugs are not, by and large, globally, are not able to access uh, the um, revolution that's taking place with Hep C treatment. So, as you can see here, as it says here, DAAs only help you once you get here, but um, for most countries in Asia, the largest gap uh, is up to 90 to 95 percent of HCV infected are unaware that they are infected. And this includes, you know, those who, who may have acquired Hep C through injecting drug use, but also um, through blood transfusion, etc. So the first order of call in our region in terms of hepatitis C is to raise awareness, particularly amongst uh, people who inject drugs. And uh, as with HIV, that, that cascade, the linkage to care uh, will need to be improved in a major way if we are going to uh, reach the um, kinds of SVR that we want to see. Uh, this is Van Gogh's painting, which leads me to the issue of mental illness. Um, this, as, as I said at the beginning, when we when we take care of people who inject drugs, it's usually not a mono problem. There, is, there are a multitude of problems that, um, that need to be addressed. And this is uh, from a very large cohort um, in the UK um, of uh, 59 UK specialist centers that look after people who use drugs, uh, sorry, with, uh, with uh, chronic hep C infection. And uh, th they looked at more than 6,000 patients close to 60% of whom acquired the hep C through injecting drug use. And what they found was depression was common, uh, certainly amongst people, who, previous uh, injecting drug users, it's uh, nearly half of them, or half of them uh, were, were uh, having symptoms of depression. Those who are still using uh, drugs, 68.1%, and amongst uh, hep C positive patients who are non-injecting drug users, uh, around a quarter of them, um, complain of depression. So um, mental illness and, and drug use is something that um, uh, doesn't get a lot of attention but certainly complicates care in, in a major way. Um, these are some prevalence estimates uh, that I could find in uh, Australia. Uh, it's as, this is among substance use treatment clients. Um, anywhere between 50, close to 50 to 100 percent have some form of mental disorder. Depression was found within 27 to 85 percent and generalized anxiety disorder um, in 1 to 75 percent. Whereas in the U.S., in a national survey on drug use and health, any form of mental illness and uh, certainly serious mental illness um, amongst people who use drugs is high. We found the same in Malaysia. No doubt this was in a, uh, in a cohort of prisoners that we um, engaged with in Kajang prison, um, 200 of whom were HIV positive and 200 were non-HIV uh, positive. The overwhelmingly, the HIV positive patients were amongst, uh, were acquired the HIV uh, through injecting drug use because um, uh, drug use is criminalized in Malaysia, so many uh, are in prison. So as you, you can see there, uh, the rates of uh, psychiatric disorder is extremely high. Any form of psychiatric uh, disorder is 44%. Um, psychotic disorder uh, is 11%. Um, and uh, other 
uh, forms of uh, mental illness is extremely high in, in this cohort of HIV positive prisoners and negative prisoners in Kajang prison. Unfortunately, the uh, mental health services within the prison system in Malaysia um, remains uh, a little wanting. Next, we move to chemsex, and you heard a little bit about it. Um, uh, fr you heard much about it from Fritz uh, earlier this morning. You know, we, we, we haven't even managed to really, uh, as, as a global community, we haven't really managed to deal with uh, the traditional opiate um, disorders in terms of um, addressing the HIV, Hep C, and mental health concern, and now we really have to uh, step up uh, with, in inverted commas, new drugs, um, the ATS uh, and other kinds of stimulants that, um, uh, you know, the, 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 in fact, in many parts of Asia and Australia, and I think UK as well, has uh, in many ways overtaken the heroin epidemic that uh, we've lived with in the last few decades. So uh, if, if we focus on uh, this uh, type of drug used among MSM, it's uh, typically episodic. Um, there's a wide variation by demographic groups. You have doctors, you have lawyers, you have uh, others uh, using these drugs. Polydrug use is typical, um, although injection uh, has been low globally, but uh, certainly it is uh, not uh, absent. And uh, stimulant and club drug use are common. And this is a composite of uh, recent studies of uh, ATS use uh, amongst MSM in Asia. As you can see, uh, meth and crystal meth are uh, some of the more common drugs that's uh, being used um, around the region. And what it does, as you heard uh, earlier, is that uh, it is uh, um, driving the HIV um, epidemic in the region. So they're more like in this um, study that my colleagues, uh, Howie Lim, uh, Thomas uh, from here from here in Bangkok and, and Rick Altis uh, from Yale done, looked at, um, a, did a survey through um, an Asian internet MSM sex survey. ATS use was significantly uh, associated with having more sex partners, to have group sex, inconsistent condom use, to be HIV infected and to have uh, uh, sexually transmitted infections compared to those um, who had negligible substance use. And, um, you've seen this uh, graph from Fritz, although his, his uh, graph was prettier than mine. <laughs> um, okay, so what can we do in terms of managing um, ATS use in uh, uh, sexual settings among men who have sex with men? I think the number one would be to uh, address the stigma and discrimination that uh, people who use drugs as well as MSM in Malaysia and in the region that um, uh, that kind of uh, is one of the risk factors for uh, this drug use. Um, so there is a need to, inc this was uh, a qualitative study that again Howie and, and, um, and my colleagues uh, did in a a group of, I think it was a very in-depth study of about 20 um, MSM with um, uh, who are using ATS. So there is a need to increase access to HIV preven prevention services such as PrEP and PEP, professional support, particularly mental health uh, illness um, support, and uh, substance use treatment for uh, drug using MSM in a more open and friendly environment, which is, of course, uh, easier said than done. In, in the setting of Malaysia. And finally, in terms of what interventions can we do, what, what, um, how do we address these huge gaps uh, in prevention services, in treatment services for uh, drug, people who use drugs who are being left behind? I think one important principle is that um, the health needs for people who use drugs um, can be very different depending on the subgroup that you're dealing with, whether you're dealing with women who use drugs in uh, Central Asia, or whether you're dealing with young men in young MSM in the UK, or prisoners, or, or um, those uh, uh, engaging in chemsex. 
Um, in the traditional way, in terms of uh, the HIV treatment cascade amongst people who inject drugs, we know that um, whether it's diagnosis, linkage to care, retention in care, receipt of ART and adherence, will differ based on local context and funding priorities. And I think this is where, where um, drug use is so criminalized, such as, such, such as it is in my country, that we will need to look at interventions um, using a technology um, to bring people into care and to link them into care much, much more than uh, we're doing at the moment, rather than the traditional um, attendance at clinics and so forth. Um, this is uh, from Jamie Meyer from, from Yale, who uh, did a uh, summary of some of the um, evidence-based um, interventions that can be implemented based on uh, at, at different uh, levels of the uh, HIV continuum of care, and, and which includes uh, opt-out testing, on-site rapid testing, peer-driven interventions, community outreach, nothing, nothing that's really new or revolutionary, and certainly whatever applies to HIV certainly applies to Hep C. But um, uh, as, as mentioned, um, uh, all these uh, interventions um, are very much easier said than done um, in a setting where m much of the funding goes towards criminalization than towards uh, health care of people who use drugs. I won't go into this because really, uh, perhaps uh, to just emphasize that integrated care, whether it's for HIV or Hep C, is paramount. Um, and within it, um, you know, drug use and psychiatric, so this would be the Rolls Royce of, uh, of treatment for people, who in, for people who use drugs. You know, you've got everything on, on site. Um, but as mentioned, more likely than not, uh, that site happens to be in prison, um, at least in Malaysia, where 60% of uh, prisoners are, are in there for minor drug offences. I guess if you look on the bright side, this would be one place where you could initiate treatment um, and care, whether it's for HIV or Hep C. And it's worth uh, emphasizing that whilst the health needs are huge uh, for many who use drugs, especially if they've had uh, time in prison, the health needs are pretty much um, secondary to other more um, pressing needs like finding a house to live in once they leave prison, getting a job, getting connected to family, getting connected to society. So, you know, going to the clinic to get themselves tested for HIV or to, to get their antiretroviral therapy is secondary to, um, well, uh, getting back their lives so, uh, and, and their basic needs. So there are many, many more things that we need to consider when we're managing uh, people who use drugs with uh, HIV or Hep C. And so um, this is where I'd like to end that um, the health needs of people who use drugs cannot be separated from um, the other psychosocial support uh, that is needed. After all, if uh, they still continue to live a chaotic life, um, the chances of them adhering to the HIV treatment or, or PrEP or um, Hep C treatment is going to be less likely. So equal attention needs to be paid towards um, all these other things, including um, underlying mental illness or mental Ill illnesses that have come as a result of substance use um, when we manage uh, people living with, sorry, people who use drugs. So I just want to end here by saying um, that the health needs for people who use drugs are enormous and varied. And the, the types of, of illnesses will depend on different contexts and the types of intervention that we uh, implement will, will be different depending on different contexts. Like I said, whether it's a woman in Iran or, or street drug users in Malaysia or, or, or MSM uh, in the UK or uh, Russians in prison. And by and large, people who use drugs are left behind in the prevention and treatment revolution that we're witnessing, whether it's for HIV or hepatitis C globally. 
And what really is required is a paradigm shift from criminalization of drug use to drug use being viewed as a health issue globally. Thank you very much. So we do have a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any questions. While we're waiting, I have a quick question for you. So one thing we've seen in Bangkok in the last two years, which I'd never seen before, is injection of crystal methamphetamine, which seems um, more and more common among the MSM and transgender community. And I wonder if you've seen that in other, uh, other countries in the region, mm -hmm. um, and if, if people who inject crystal meth, are they somehow different than people who inject heroin, or do we need to address them differently in any way? Yeah, I think we're also starting to see it in Malaysia and um, going by first principles, you know, they need to be offered the same kinds of um, prevention services, uh, including clean needles and syringes. Um, but of course, you don't have the um, methadone or buprenorphine equivalent. Um, and that's where the um, much, much more research needs to be done. Mm -hmm. We have a question over there. Yeah. Hello. Um, the f you said 60% of people um, got hepatitis C were intravenous drug users. So the other 40%, I mean, how did they contract it? Um, so it, in, you know, um, in the past from blood transfusion uh, would be the um, most common uh, mode of transmission uh, in addition to injecting drug use. But there is also a significant proportion where the uh, source of, of uh, infection is not known. I, I, I said 60% are in prison um, because of injecting drug use. But yes, the, a large component of uh, people who, in, who um, get hepatitis C we, we would be injecting drug use, previous blood transfusion, and a big unknown. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Adiba.